Hello, 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 everybody. Good afternoon. This is Pierre coming to you live here from Chittering, answering your questions that you've sent in to me last week following my email. I'm reaching out to you to say thanks so much. I have absolutely been blown away by the amount of questions I've had. I've got some names and people on the screen. Look at my wheel over there, ready to go and pick somebody. So maybe you see your name on there. I um, am just, of course, answering all those questions as we're getting out of this lockdown and see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm here to answer your questions and see how we can help while we're all still at home. So let's fire away. I have got a list of questions today and I just want to say again, thank you so much. The aim of this video is purely to help and add value because we know at the moment many of you sit there and know that, you know what, as much as you want to get those floors and furnishings cared for, it may be not just the right time for you. And if you're ready now, we are. But maybe you're ready later and we will be there for you. So let's fire away. First question I had came from Jane Preslin. She asked, if you have a very old wooden block floor um, and need it sanded and treated, will that prevent us getting white water stains on it when we accidentally spill water or when the cat sneeze or dribble? Now, of course, the poor cat sneeze or dribble leaving a little mark on the floor clearly indicates to me that there might be somewhere on that floor. So what I want to show you is uh, show you a little bit of a video here of what you probably see. You might have a floor like that, Jane, and uh, what you have is I've got a wet cloth here, and as soon as some water gets on the floor, you would notice that it starts to go dark. Now, usually when that happens, it indicates that that floor has not got a layer of protection on it. So, to explain this, I have an example here. So you can see this floor is getting quite dark if it gets wet. And then over here, I have just a simple layer of plastic over the top. And the layer of plastic will stop that moisture penetrating into the wood. And that means if I rub it there, you'll notice that it doesn't go dark. Now, of course, there's another purpose to this little thing I've prepared for another question, but I just wanted to say that when you treat your floor, you either apply a product like this one, which is a lacquer. This is a polyurethane coating that goes on top of the floor and basically creates a surface build finish. This is similar to the little plastic I've shown you, so that protects the floor on top. Now, if you rather, you can also apply an oil finish, and this oil finish from Pelman is something we love. We have been applying it for many years around Cambridge, and people really love this. That penetrates into the wood floor, similar to the water example I've given you here, but instead of it being water, of course, it's oil with a hardener, and it sits inside the wood, and it protects it from there. So... Your question is, will a coating protect this floor from having marks like this? Um, so Jane, absolutely your floor will. Um, you need to just consider, no matter how good that finish is, if you spill something and you leave it on there, whether that is your polyurethane coating or whether that's your oil coating, you will still find that that can penetrate overnight. And the story I like to tell is, if you get up at night as you leave the sofa on the way to the bed, and you by accident knock over that half a glass of wine and you don't see it, you leave it overnight, and you come back the next morning, and you go, oh my goodness me, there's something on the floor, you will still have a mark, regardless of what finish you have, because over time that can penetrate any finish. Um, so then, of course, that's something to deal with. But what these finishes do, they buy you time and they protect your floor. So let's move on and we talk to uh, the, 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 we talk about the cre uh, question from Christine. Christine, um, she says, how can you deal best with moth on a wool carpet and rug, and how can we prevent them from the in the first place? Bearing in mind that some areas are hard to reach due to presence of large pieces of furniture. So Christine, uh, the last part of your question, of course, has got a key to it, heavy pieces of furniture. That is, those items sit on that carpet and they hardly ever move. And that's where those moths like to hide. Uh, they hide under the furniture and they don't like to be disturbed. So they find themselves a nice little home under there. 
and that's where they sit. And if you don't move the furniture, that's where they start to breed. And that's usually where the, the moths lay the eggs because they know that's where their babies are going to be safe. The other place to look for is also in the airing cupboard. So they will go somewhere where they're not going to be disturbed. And that's the key. The first thing you can do is keep on top of the vacuuming. A regular good vacuum will definitely chase them away because they don't like the noise. They don't like to be disturbed. And of course, the vacuum sucks up the eggs and all the other babies and all that. Um, and that caused them to, to go. Now, of course, if you do not want to have that hassle, but of course, I would always recommend that. The absolute other side of the scale is to then look at, well, you know, let's say you do have a lot of moth. Then you can go, you know what, how do we treat them? Then an insecticide is the way to go. But I'd be very straight with you. Christine, I do not like to use an insecticide in somebody's home. This is a poison that is spray, sprayed on the carpet to kill the insects. Now, of course, if a poison is taken in your home, it's not good for your health either. So what we do at Art of Clean, I would rather pass that on to a trusted friend and say you can do it because they do it every day. They absolutely stay on top of the training, which is so essential. Um, you know, I, and, and I come from a good place here. I know there's carpet cleaners out there that offer the service and, you know, they're good as gold. I don't want to say they don't do a safe service for you. The only thing is, if you don't do it on a regular basis, you don't attend regular training, you won't be absolutely at the forefront on this. And as a cleaner myself, I know our team goes out and we see moths from time to time, but not often enough to say, you know what, we absolutely have everything and we treat moths every day. So for that reason, I move away from spraying an insecticide on the carpet. What we'd rather do is apply something that's like salt that makes the carpet less tasty for the moths. And for that reason, they will less likely move into your carpet. So we can apply that for you. And it's a very safe product. It's not the insecticide. But even down from that, I like to go and solve something that's easy and simple to deal with. And that is by just simply saying, get a regular vacuum on the carpet. Keep that going. Move the furniture as hard as it sometimes can be. Don't let them stand there for months on end. Then after that, just speak to the neighbors as well. Because I've seen it before where somebody phones me out of desperation saying, oh, Pierre, I've done everything. I've had the pest control mania and I still find moths. And then after several months, they speak to the neighbor and the neighbor said, yeah, I see them flying around. And uh, yeah, it doesn't bother me much. So they're actually breeding next door and then crawling through the, the, the cracks into your home and that's where they go. So speak to the neighbors as well. And another little tip, if you vacuum the carpet, take that vacuum, empty it outside in the bin. Don't leave it in the cupboard because they crawl out of the vacuum and make a little home in the airing cupboard where the vacuum cleaner is stored. So Christine, I hope that helps you. I know it's probably not giving you a solution as to what to do with the heavy furniture, but every so many months, give it a move and move that, uh, uh, get the vacuum cleaner on there. Let's move on to Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie asks, would you recommend a good cleaner who are trained properly? So Anne-Marie, what I'll do for you is I will send you an email with two companies we work with. And these people are domestic cleaners that do a lovely job. I always recommend them. So they will be your people to turn to. And there are also several others around Cambridge that do a lovely job. Um, so speak to these people that I will include. And for those of you that might also be interested in the answer, I'll post this video afterwards on our social channels. And I'll also put a link to these people that we recommend in the link below. Uh, the next question I had was for Nancy. Nancy says, can carpets that have sat in storage encounter all sorts of weather ever be rid from musty smell and that have taken on due to the weather changes I've been exposed to? I'm talking perhaps 10 years storage. So uh, Nancy has stored her rug and um, now she's taken it out what sounds like to be about 10 years time and now that rug smells musty. Now, I have done another video about uh, storing your rug, and of course, Nancy talks here about carpets, but I assume that's rugs, although the equal applies to carpets in it, of case they get stored. Um, you want to store them in Tyvek. Now, in my other video, um, I talk about storing carpets in Tyvek. This is the type of material, and that allows for breathability through the fabric and also for moisture movement because you don't want to store it in plastic, otherwise it traps the moisture and it makes that rug even more musty and it can easily rot the rug, so I would advise store it somewhere. In my other video, I do talk about using a hygrometer that measures the temperature and the humidity in the air. It's never good to store that rug in high humidity. 
uh, no matter how good the wrapping is, you put it in, in it. So Nancy, I'll send you a link to that video as well in the hope that it helps. But just so that we answer a question that you might have with regards to now it's smell, what do I do? What I would say is the best we can do is give that rug a thorough deep wet saturation clean. That is if it's safe to do so, there are certain rugs that need special testing for that to be done beforehand but we can always advise if you give us a shout and let us have a look at the rug but usually saturation clean is the best way to deal with that problem uh the next one is judith judith asked we have wax floor flooring by our sliding door and the floor has sometimes been wet by the rain and then dried and has lost its protection what should we do to prep the floor before re-waxing the area the oak is thick enough to take sanding with, without causing problems. Um, so Judith, what you're asking about is, can this floor uh, be sanded? Now also Judith has sent over some photos, which was brilliant, Judith, thank you very much for that. And also you talked about um, applying uh, the Osmo oil to the floor as that was what was done before. So you said in your email, in your photos. Now we don't apply Osmo a lot, but in your case, let's talk about this. Um, very briefly, I'm going to tell you more about the types of finishes. Earlier I talked about the lacquer finish and I talked about the oil finish and each one of them, one is either a surface finish which means it sits at the top, like I said it's like a coating that sits on the surface of the wood and the other one is a penetrating finish which is remember like the oil we apply it and it penetrates into the wood so it doesn't necessarily sit on top but it's rather sitting inside so what you would need to do in these cases especially um, if you have the surface coating which is by the way also most of the time uh, Osmo oil Osmo oil is rolled on with, with a very thin pile roller in normal cases now I know there's exceptions that some people might buff it into the floor and not leave any surface coating so normally if you follow the instructions by Osmo you will end up with a surface coating and also seeing those photos I can see the rain has taken some of those that coating away from the surface so this means that the following has happened you now have a coating with holes in it where the coating has worn away so here is what we've got let's have a look at this i'm going to make a bit of space and i'm going to show you so we've got a coating here that has some holes in it do you notice i've cut some holes in there sorry let me get there um you've got some holes in this right so now what happens if you would apply a, a finish without sanding this floor back properly what we'll find is that we'll apply this coating onto this area and notice what happens where this finish has broken away and worn away you have the oil in your case the osmo which you reapply penetrate but i'm wiping this cleaner which uh, my, mine is just water but i'm representing what would happen if you apply finish over a coating that you have not sanded off right if you have not sanded it off here's what's going to happen if you look at that you see the coating has protected some areas of the floor and others has not so it's penetrated in the areas where the finish has wear and worn off and that's the reason why you will have a patchy finish if you do not sand that surface back so what you would need to do is sand that area back now you can if you're lucky and your boards finish right on top of each other so let's say the boards run that way and you have got a board that finish and the door is this side and let's say you can finish on a line that means you just sand these few boards it means that you can get away by only doing the board but you will have a color difference and it might very likely look ugly because it's very difficult to stop on a line um, so normally what we would recommend is sand the floor back fully and what I can do for you is also send you a guide on how to sand the floors uh, to prepare them for the application of the oil again and of course follow the instructions from Osmo to do so so that would help um, let's see who's next uh, the next one is Karen now Karen you sent me three questions I'm going to go very briefly through through them and see if I can answer those three for you they are on carpets made of sisal or hemp can carpets made of sisal or hemp be cleaned and in the same way as wool and carp uh, wool or polyester carpets can so what I've got here for you Karen is I have a sample piece of carpet so this is the stuff that Karen wants to know if it can be cleaned and this 
item is a natural fiber. It means it comes from a plant. So what would happen with this fiber is you, if you clean it, it's firstly, of course, extremely absorbent. So if I wet this, it would soak the water up and it would take very long to dry. And the next thing is these fibers swell out and they become very thick. And that's the reason why this carpet would shrink. So these carpets are not some things that can safely be cleaned in the same way as you can do a wool or a polyester carpet, as per Karen's question. Um, Karen, what can be done to this is a low moisture clean. But one thing to remember, um, if you have a big old stain on there, you know what, it's probably unlikely that that would come out. But give us a call and send us a photo of the problem you have, and I might be able to answer it for you. Let's have a look at her second question. Is there a way to tell if a wood floor is engineered other than prying out the section taking a, to take a look? Uh, does the age help, for instance, if it's less than 30 years old, is it likely to be engineered? Am I uh, asking because our kitchen floor is badly scuffed, scraped and scratched and I'm not sure what would be possible to sand it again if it is not solid. Okay, let's quickly see how we can help Karen with this. Um, now, Karen talks about the solid floor, and I'll switch on my other camera to show you. So this is a solid wood floor. This solid wood floor, you can see, has got wood that runs all the way from the top all the way through to the bottom, and that is a solid floor. That means that floor has got wood all the way through, and it's the same timber, okay? Over here, I've got an example of engineered board. And on the back of this board, you can see we have a quality ply. And you can see there that this bit at the top is oak. And this bit below is actually engineered. Now, why do they make an engineered board? Engineered board is made because of its stability. It's stable. It doesn't move, especially when moisture absorbs into a solid floor you will find that there's gaps opening up that floor move a lot more than an engineered board, especially if you're under floor heating, the engineered board is the way to go. Sometimes people say, oh, no, I don't want the engineered board. You know what, Pierre? Not at all. I just want the best and I want, to, I want the solid wood floor. That's fine. That's fine. In some cases, yes, a solid wood floor is brilliant. It is very nice, but here's the reality. You cannot get more life out of a solid wood floor than you can out of an engineered floor, and here's why. These floors lock into each other most of the time uh, via tongue and groove. And the best is, if I show you a little bit of a close-up here, so you can see there, it's got a tongue and a groove, and they lock into each other, and that forms your floor. So you can see there the tongue, and that's the groove, and they slot into each other. Exactly the similar thing with your solid. You see there we've got a groove, and on the other side we have a tongue. Now, regardless of these two boards, this one is solid and this one is engineered, what you'll have is you'll sand this floor over time until you get to a point where there's nothing much left at the surface, and if you sand any more, you'll break through to the ply underneath, but actually you will cut through to the tongue, which means the side starts to break off. Exactly the same would happen with your solid. So if you even have to have a solid, it doesn't mean that you can keep sanding until you get to the very bottom of it. Your tongue and groove will determine how far you can go. Other than that, the tongue will just uh, break off. Um, so that is the difference between that. And to answer your question, Karen, how would you know? You talk about age. The best way to know is by looking at the side of the board. So on my video there, you can see the side of the board and you can see the layers that's formed. And you can see the top layer there, where on this side, you can see the wood flowing all the way through. So normally a threshold can open up and you can see the side. Otherwise, the radiator pipe where it goes into the floor, if you had that little cap lifted up, look down the side of the pipe and you would see whether that wood runs all the way down or whether it is like here, the engineered. There is some truth in saying that if the floor is as old as 60s or 70s, that by that point forward, it might be engineered. But even today, there are many solid wood floors, so it's not necessarily an indication of whether that is an engineered floor or not. It just adds to it that if it's older than or new, younger than 1960s, 1970s, that's the age when the engineered board started. That's the point where you can say, okay, now maybe this is engineered. Let's go ahead and talk about Karen's last question. What's the best finish for a wood floor in a house with big dogs? It needs to be really hard wearing, uh, but not crazy slippery. That is a brilliant question, Karen. And I thank you so much for submitting that question. Now, again, it comes back to this is a lacquer finish, as I mentioned earlier, a coating that sits at the top of the board, like my example here, where the oil finish is a penetrating finish 
that sits inside the floor. If I can give you an example with the water, but this is of course oil of two component finish, penetrates inside. So the one that gives us a little less slipperiness is the oil. And the oil finish is extremely popular exactly for this reason. What happens is the dog will run on the floor and what would happen is the dog starts finding it a little bit slippery. So they extend their claws to get a bit of a better grip. And if this is on your lacquered finish floor, you will find this can wear out quite quick. Where if it is an oiled finish which penetrate into the wood, there's a little bit more grip, although these ones are all approved. You will not, well, would I say, be careful now. You will struggle to find an approved quality finish that is not meeting the slip resistance standard required. So by having a lacquer doesn't mean it's more slippery. It is just that the oil has got a little bit more of an edge over how slippery it is. But be aware, I've seen many people call me and say, Pierre, my floor is awfully slippery. What do I do? What's the finish that I need to have? And then we find out it's only because cleaning doesn't happen right. So first of all, look at the cleaning. Secondly, if you have dogs, um, what we're going to do, Karen, is definitely a advice on the oil finish. Now, it is a more matte look and it's very popular at the moment. Um, a more matte look and that works quite well. So I would always recommend the oil finish to be the better one. And what I definitely would advise these people here, Palman from Germany gets my absolute vote because they are outstanding at their customer service, great support. We've used them for years and this brilliant product. Um, so I, I trust that answer your question. Next is a very long standing client of ours, Stuart. Stuart, Stuart reached out to us and uh, Stuart, I just want to say thank you so much for reacting to our email and getting your question in. Um, let's have a look what he says. Uh, he says, our shark vacuum has stopped working and we need a spare part. And the guy that did take a look at it mentioned the SIBO, which I seem to uh, see you also mention. I don't suppose you sell any. Uh, Stuart, thank you very much for your question. Actually, we can source SIBO vacuum cleaners. I would absolutely want to give you the true answer that I would give anybody asking me whether we sell a vacuum. I'd love to sell you a vacuum cleaner. The reality is the profit we'll make on that is tiny. It is really a small amount. If you do retail, um, you would need to sell a lot of product to make some money from it. So there are companies out there that go to SIBO or any other similar retailer and go, you know what, we want to sell your product. And they would normally say, well, how many are you going to sell? And they'll say, well, I think we'll probably sell sort of 500,000 and then they'll come to an agreement and they'll say, well, as you're going to sell that volume, we'll give you a wonderful discount. And then also, if you do reach that goal, we will also give you a bit of a kickback at the end. That means if they sell all the 500,000, they also get another, say, 10,000 pounds afterwards. Now, what these companies do then is they'll go on Amazon and they'll sell these vacuum cleaners absolutely at rock bottom prices, which means they know if they shift 500,000, they'll still get their 10,000 pounds at the end. So what they do is they sell at that cost which means that people like us that don't have that negotiation power because I'm never going to sell so many vacuum cleaners just don't stand a chance. So Stuart, to answer your question, I would advise go see the lovely people at John Lewis. They will definitely help you. Their advice is outstanding. You can even go to their website. And also what I love about John Lewis, and I'm sure the other people watching this video would agree, their customer service is absolutely spot on. So if there's any, any time a little issue with it, you know what, you can always go back and they'll help you and support you. Uh, Mary was uh, has been a very long standing client of ours and she writes in, I'm a painter and during the lockdown I've had a mess up with some acrylic and a little oil and a Persian rug. Do you have any tips of getting it out? Okay, Mary, yes, paint can be a bit of a challenge. Acrylic tends to most of the time be water-based and that means that you can just go and get a, a, a towel and very carefully remove that, dilute that down and remove it from the, from the rug or the carpet or the fabric. Um, of course, you need to dilute it enough to lift out, that out. And what I would advise, a, a cotton towel like this that absorbs quite a bit. So one with a little bit of moisture on there, dab it and then get it out that way. That's, of course, if it's water-based and if you have managed to do it while it just happened. The other thing that I always would say, if it's a lot and you feel unsure, leave it, just leave it totally and give us a call. We can at, at, at least help you with that. But here's what I assume. Here's what I assume that you probably have had that happen to you. You might have attempted that removing it and now it's sort of worked into the pile. 
and it's now gone crusty and hard and you really struggle to get it out now my aim with these videos would be to totally empower you and help you as much as i can till the time is right for us to come out and help you so let's see what i can do here's what i can advise get yourself a little bit of this stuff surgical spirit this is alcohol right and take this and use that and try and and break that pain down by using a little bit of this now i would think that the due to the modern technologies in paint it is very uh, tough and once it's dry it's going to be very difficult to remove and what i would say is be very careful when you use this but you can try a little bit of this and see if it softens that paint and uh, remove it that way um, also as it's uh, as it as it softens it use a blunt instrument to just try and scrape up what you have the other tip I can give you is if you have added that little blob that falls on the carbon and you thought, you know what, I'll leave it, I'll just leave it and see what it dries. You know what does a handy is, get a nice little sharp scissor. Um, and I can use a little example here. This one is not that brilliant, but you want something with a very sharp end. You know, um, a, a nail cutter would also be a very nice little tool. And what you want to do is you just want to get it into below that surface of the and the paint and just give it a little snip but be careful not to dig a deep old hole in your car but this is if it literally sits at the top and you don't want to disturb those fibers so mary i hope that helps you otherwise you reach out to us and uh, see what we can do now i do have two more questions and i'm quickly going to scan through them debbie debbie reached out to us and said i have two daughters in the house and i have fake tan stains on both my bedroom carpets how can i remove it okay debbie thanks again for your question I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is it's probably not going to come out. Okay, uh, fake tan is something we even struggle with. Now, what you can do, as I said earlier, these videos is totally to empower you to do it. But please advise, be advised that what I've said earlier, even about the surgical spirit, and what I'm going to tell you now is purely please understand it by own risk and do a little test in an inconspicuous area first. So what I would say is make sure that carpet is thoroughly cleaned and then what you can do if all else fails and you think, you know what, I'm just going to change the carpet if I can't get this out, here's a little advice I can give you. Get yourself a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. Now this is not the, I would advise against the gooey stuff you use for your hair. Um, you want to get a liquid uh, hydrogen peroxide and then use that and very carefully apply it just to a small area inside the stained area. And what you'll find is the product takes time to work so apply a little bit and leave it and see if it lightens the area but please understand it will strip color out so you need to be very very careful um and and just apply it a little bit try that and if that fails then of course unfortunately i think the replacement is the way to go but please i stress again the advice i give you here is please you take your own risk with your carpets please test in an inconspicuous area first before you go ahead and do it unless you know you know what this is the last attempt if that doesn't work then there's something else which will include maybe replacing the carpet now let's move on to uh, last but very certainly not least is Russell. Russell's reached out to me and say, how can soot from my fireplace safely be removed from my carpets and upholstery? Uh, Russell, thank you so much for this very good question because many of our clients have got fireplaces and they think, you know what, how am I going to get this soot out of the carpet? Because sometimes the chimney sweep has been and now they're as careful as they are there's still a little bit of soot or sometimes I carry something out cleaning the fireplace and I dump something on the carpet and now I'm going what am I going to do so a little secret about soot soot has got a magnetic field to it that carbon and it grabs onto carpets really easily especially synthetic carpets so if you have an 80 20 carpet mix there's some synthetic in there and that fire that that soot will grab onto that fiber so the first thing you want to do grab your vacuum cleaner and adjust that uh, uh, height of your vacuum cleaner as high as you can and then what you want to do is whiz over that with your vacuum cleaner very carefully because what you'll create is a vacuum chamber and the brush will not beat the carpet so if you have it of course if you have a brush cup a brush a vacuum cleaner a upright vacuum cleaner so that's what you want to do there um, and then very carefully otherwise you can detach the hose and just use the, the vacuum and just pull that dry soot out before you introduce anything to that and just keep doing that and as you have now vacuumed your floor you can drop down that uh, that that beta bar closer to the carpet and then it starts lifting it out because you want to lift that out and dry as much as possible vacuum and vacuum and vacuum again 
And that's my advice, something you can do. Be very careful and tempted to go and grab a cloth and start rubbing at the carpet because that will just make it worse. And if it comes to cleaners, use a, a very specific cleaners are needed for this type of thing. And also once those cleaners are used, you need to neutralize them. So as much as I wanna give you advice as to what you can do, to um, get that cleaned yourself, you know what, I would advise rather give us a call if the vacuuming alone hasn't given you the result. And this is especially true when it's on your upholstery. On your upholstery, get yourself an attachment with some bristles on there and very carefully just work it and use the air to suck that off the uh, fibers before you go. Now that gets us to the end, but what I want to do is I want to give away a prize today for those people that have been so kind um, to send in their, um, their questions. And what I've done is I have uh, got a wheel here and the wheel shows us uh, the different people that sent in their questions as you can see there on the camera. And uh, the prize I'm going to give away Today, the prize I'm going to give away is a lovely clean and go kit from Pelman. Uh, my friend Mike Hamer and Sam has been so kind uh, to sponsor us uh, some of these kits. And inside the kit, you do have, let's have a look, you have a mop for dry soil removal. And then you have a cleaner. This is a general everyday cleaner that you can keep on top of. And you have your microfiber mop. Um, this way it's a general cleaner that we will just deal with everyday marks and stains on your wooden floor and uh, that's what we've got here so to thank you for your questions I have uh, got this to give away and to go with that I also have a lovely Utsun t-shirt and I also have a beautiful Palman t-shirt just like the one I'm wearing here um, this is your Palman t-shirt and I'll pop that in and to go out to you. So there you go, there's your prize. Let's go over to the Wheel of Fortune and see what we can do with regards to who's the winner. Let's have a look. We'll give it a spin and we see where it stops. So here we go. It's going, it's going, it's spinning. Who's gonna be our winner? Oh, is it gonna be Debbie? Oh no, Stuart just missed out. Jane, no. Mary, Mary, oh Mary, well done. You can see there it stopped on Mary. Mary is our winner. So Mary, I'm gonna send you out these goodies and uh, this is for you. Thank you so much for submitting your question and here's what we're gonna do. As you know, we've got three other major prizes to win. That would be a full house of cleaning up to a thousand pounds. We also have a lovely, beautiful SIBO vacuum cleaner to give away and then we have that rug. Um, those three items will be chosen at the end of this session after we've had many questions and then we'll spin the Wheel of Fortune again and choose the big winner. So on that note everybody, thank you so much for your questions. I really appreciate it. If you want to know more, reach me at Art of Clean and I'm more than happy to answer all your questions. So thanks again. Keep them coming if you might think of any more. I say goodbye for now. Stay safe. Stay well.